All right, so let's get started, everybody. Um, thank you to everyone so much for, for joining uh, this webinar on preemptive purchase rights. Uh, we are happy to be with you here today. Um, I'm David Howard with the National Young Farmers Coalition. Um, I'll give you a, a quick uh, sense of the uh, agenda for today, and then we'll do um, introductions of our presenters, and then we'll do introductions briefly um, for folks who have um, uh, joined us today. So uh, we, Holly and I will go through an overview of the policy history of preemptive purchase rights in New York um, and why preemptive purchase rights are important. Uh, and then we'll hear from Carrie Watkins Bates from Scenic Hudson and then Jim Olden from Oldham from Equity Trust and then Marissa Cody from Columbia Land Conservancy. And we'll have time for a Q&A with um, Dave Bame uh, from Ag and Markets. And we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end, but we'll also have time for questions after each presenter. Um, during the presentation portions, if you could mute your mics um, so we don't have any background noise, and then we'll stop for, for Q&A uh, in between uh, each presenter. Um, so, And if anyone else wants to join us on video, David and I don't have to be the only ones. <laughs> yes, you are but more than welcome. welcome to stay on the phone. Um, yeah, so Holly, do you want to start off introductions? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. I'm Holly Rippon-Beller with the National Young Farmers Coalition. I work on land access at the coalition and have worked with many of you over the past five or six years at this point. Um, and I'm hosting, yeah, excited to host the webinar with David and our other speakers today. Great. Um, Carrie, do you want to start? Sorry about that. Yes, this is Carrie Watkins Bates with Scenic Hudson. I'm the Assistant Land Conservation Director here. And as we'll go through in the presentation, um, we've been working with preemptive purchase rights for many years now and are, are glad to be able to share our experience with others. Uh, Jim? I am uh, Jim Oldham from Equity Trust. Uh, I direct Equity Trust. We're based in Massachusetts, but have been working in the Hudson Valley for the past six years. Talking about that work with that I've done with. And Marissa? Yep. Uh, this is Marissa Cody. I'm the Director of Agricultural Programs at the Columbia Land Conservancy. And I will talk a little bit in my slides. Um, about who we are and, and give some context and um, talk about a few key studies of the projects that we've done that use PPR. Dave? Uh, everyone, this is Dave Baim. I'm the Farmland Protection Program Manager at the uh, State Department of Ag and Markets. Uh, really pleased that you're all joining us today. Uh, I'll be available for any questions that are specific about, you know, how to kind of use this tool uh, with the uh, FPIC funded project. Great. Thanks, Dave. And I'll just kind of read down the list here so that we don't get um, crosstalk going. Um, Sam, do you want to go? Sam Calhoun. Sam might be on mute. Uh, Kaylin. Sorry. Hi, I'm Kaylin Hubbard from Delaware Highlands Conservancy. Uh, Terrence. Uh, I see uh, we have a Lori. Hi, Lori and Singer from Westchester Land Trust. Uh, thanks for joining, Lori. And Karen? I think we are having some issue with microphones today, but that's okay. Karen Rue is on. Um, Mike? Hmm. 
All right. Well, <laughs> maybe. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. If you're on the phone and you want to introduce yourself, please uh, just go ahead and do that. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll just get into it here. This is Erin Hoagland Hi. from Dutch Land Conservancy. And Jesse Marcus from Peconic Land Trust. Brene Buplan from the Agricultural Stewardship Association. Great. Thank you all for joining. Okay. Um, well, yeah, let's just get into it here. Um, Holly, do you want to get into a little bit of the overview? Yeah, sure. And I wanted to say, too, if uh, anyone has questions, feel free. If you're using the Zoom platform, you can use the chat box and we'll be checking that throughout and I'll um, make sure that we, we get to those questions. So feel free to communicate with us that way. Um, OK, great. So yeah, we're we're just going to spend a few minutes here giving a quick overview, uh, tell you um, who we are at Young Farmers Coalition, and then uh, give some stats and background on why we care and are talking about this issue. So I think many of you know us by now, but uh, National Young Farmers Coalition was founded in 2010 and in New York State, actually, by a group of farmers. And we work uh, across the country helping organize farmers and ranchers, helping them become leaders in their local communities and start local chapters. So we've got 45 farmer-led chapters in 28 states, including five in New York. Um, and we work with this network of farmer leaders around the country to, um, in, uh, to get them involved in advocacy, to help them have a voice in policy at the state and federal level. And we work on uh, passing bills, doing farm tours, uh, lobbying, that sort of thing in DC. And um, David is based in Albany and is doing some work in New York and the Northeast. Um, and we're doing it in around the country and other states as well. And we also provide training business services for farmer members. And that includes resources like um, in our land program, we've got our Finding Farmland Calculator to help farmers in their land and financing search. Um, and then we've also got guidebooks and other things. So that's a bit about Young Farmers Coalition. Um, I mentioned I lead our land access program work. So that's one of our programs at the coalition. And we've been working with land trusts uh, around the country and other conservation organizations and partners for the last five, five or so years to uh, increase knowledge and information sharing around affordable farmland protection and farmland access. Um, getting into the specifics of why we care about what's going on with preemptive purchase rights in New York and um, why this is such an important topic to us. Uh, as many of you know, farmland access is a huge challenge. It's the number one challenge for farmers around the country and in New York. And um, this is, I'll get into a few of the stats about that in a minute, but um, we really need the help of land conservation organizations and uh, all of the partners that work with farmers to make sure that we are addressing this challenge. Um, as, uh, as many of you probably know, farm and agriculture are a huge component of the New York economy. Uh, these, this stat is from a farm credit report that's a couple of years old now and uses some data from 2012. But, um, and these are all stats that are found in the report that we released uh, in 2018 called Farmland for Farmers. But um, farms in New York generate 5.4 billion in annual sales and support uh, 77,000 on farm jobs. And so this is you know, a huge part of our economy and uh, really important for us all to pay attention to, as we know. Um, Another reason that we should care about what's happening to New York farmland is that we're losing it. Um, you know, over the last uh, half century, we've lost more than half of the land in farms and nearly three quarters of family farms in New York. So this is a moment um, when we're seeing you know, farmland that's in agriculture decline and we should be thinking about what are all the tools that we have available to us to address this. Um, Go to the next slide. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, sort of 
the little bit about the, the history and the context of where we're at with New York agriculture. Um, also important to say that the average age of farmers in New York is going up. It's now 57 years of age. And um, this is some data that American Farmland Trust and Land for Good pulled together a few years ago. Uh, they found that 30% of farms are managed by farmers who are 65 years or older in New York and that the majority of these farmers don't have an operator under 45 working alongside them who's ready to take over the operation. Um, so, you know, we're in a moment in history where we've got a lot of farms and farmland that's about to transition and we know that um, purchases of farms both protected under conservation easements and not as second home properties are on the rise and that farmers who are trying to access land are doing so in this environment um, in which the value of land far exceeds often what a farmer can afford. Uh, we've seen real estate prices in New York increasing dramatically in the last 20 years and um, also some data that Jenny if from Cornell found for us for our report um, based on some USDA data was that if you map the difference between the farm real estate values and farm rental rates, um, you find that the closer a farm is to New York City, the more this value um, of what it would be on the open market diverges from its rental rate. So that's kind of showing you that the closer farms are to urban centers, I think this is sort of something we all probably know anecdotally, but there's some data behind it that the closer um, a farm is to, to the urban center of New York City, the higher its uh, real estate value is compared to its rental rate, which would sort of represent what a farmer can afford and what they'd be paying for farming. Um, you can go to the next one, Dave. So, you know, as I've said, um, access to land is a huge barrier. We're kind of at this big moment of farm transition and farmers aging out and uh, the affordability of land is a central feature in why this is a challenge for young farmers. Um, and so we're going to, I'm not going to try to explain all the ins and outs of preemptive purchase rights right now because we're going to get into that in this whole webinar. But basically the reason that we think this tool is so important is that it has the power to um, protect farms for into into the future at their agricultural value and it is really one of the few ways that we're able to combat some of the trends that I've just been talking about and making sure that farmland remains affordable to farmers. Uh, it can be an effective strategy now in helping farms transition and then um, in lowering the value and can be really helpful into the future as well. So we've seen the success of this tool in, um, in neighboring states in Vermont, um, for instance, and David will talk a bit more about this, but we um, are excited to see it being implemented in New York as well. And um, we think that there's a lot of potential to really help change the landscape of what farmland access looks like for farmers. So thank you all for your interest in this and for being partners in this work. And uh, I'll kick it over to David to talk a little bit about the policy history and what we've done in, in New York on this topic so far. Thanks, Holly. Um, yeah, and it, I think there's somebody who is not on mute who has some background noise going. So if, if you could mute your your line, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, yeah, so as Holly mentioned, um, you know, Vermont and Massachusetts have been using this approach for a long time in all of their state funded easements. And so we had, um, you know, looked to that example um, in our in our policy work researching this um, and other uh, land trusts who have been exploring this in other states have also been kind of looking to those models. Um, and there's been a lot of work around preemptive purchase rights in New York. Um, uh, initially, you know, using private funding and other sources of funding to kind of um, uh, match together with um, what's needed to cover those additional costs associated with preemptive purchase rights. Um, so when we wrote this report, we found that there were about 20 projects um, with uh, now, a, you know, 10, 10 or more in development um, uh, at, over the last uh, year or so. Uh, so this this tool is being adopted, um, and there is a lot of interest in it. And I think it's been interesting to see the sort of conversation around this um, shift in in recent years. I think in 2017, 
uh, in 2018, there was a, a major shift in that conversation. And, um, you know, we saw a lot of interest from land trusts sort of up the Hudson Valley and in the capital region. And, um, you know, the department was great in, in responding to that interest um, with the round 16 request for proposals um, change that came out in May 2018. Um, oops. And, um, you know, along the way, we had been looking for a legislative uh, solution to also kind of back that up. So the department really had that um, statutory um, uh, clarity to lean on in, in supporting this approach as well. So we worked with a broad variety of um, stakeholders in the land trust community, um, Farm Bureau, AFT, and others uh, to get the Working Farm Protection Act passed so that this uh, tool is explicitly available. Um, in the statute and, and in this program. Um, a year out from when round 16 was put out, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to kind of check back in with the land trust community, with all of you, um, and kind of see where uh, your thoughts are in regard to this tool being available and um, how you're making use of it or how you're thinking about using it in the future. Um, you know, we really recognize that if there's going to be increased adoption of this approach, like that needs to come from a very sort of iterative and, and thoughtful process um, that comes from the land trust community and, um, and that there might be some sort of um, educational work that, that we could help facilitate. And so we did this survey to kind of find out what interest there might be in learning more about preemptive purchase rights and implementing the use of this tool over the next um, round of of FPIG funding and, and out into the next five and 10 years. And generally what we found through that survey is that, yes, there is a fair amount of, of interest in at least exploring this idea, um, but there's a lot of questions as well. Uh, so that's really why we're, we're here today and why we've um, asked um, Marissa, Gary, and, and Jim, and Dave to join us here to, to kind of get into the weeds and, and talk a little bit about some of that detail. Um, so again, thank you and I will um, and here's our contact information if you don't have it for Holly and me. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to uh, Carrie Watkins Bates with uh, Scenic Hudson to get into some of the detail here. Thanks. Thanks, David. I think many folks on the call, if, uh, if not partners of ours, are, are a bit familiar with our work. Um, our service area at Scenic Hudson is the 10 county region from the area north of the metro area up through uh, the capital district. And much of the work that we do has been in partnership again with lots of folks um, who are on this call. So um, a shout out to them as well. Scenic Hudson has been, David, you can go to the next slide. Scenic Hudson has been working in farmland protection uh, for just about 20 years, so this is really good timing for us. Go ahead. There we go. Thanks. So this Sorry, there was really a little delay good. there. That's okay. This is very good timing for us at Scenic Hudson as kind of coming up to our, our 20 year mark and, and moving past it with regard to our farmland protection efforts. We've been utilizing this tool uh, more and more and more and more find the significance and importance of it. Um, we've conserved about 19,000 acres of farmland on 130 farms. And eight of those um, in the last couple of years have included preemptive purchase rights. Um, as you all are familiar, the funds that um, are delivered through the purchase of these conservation easements is really important to help sustain and expand and transfer land for farmers. Um, for us, that's been $69 million, of which uh, a little more than 30 million of that has come directly for Scenic Hudson. So the issue of what happens to the land after the easement and how are those conservation purposes being met is really germane for us, not just um, from our conservation standpoint, but as we think about the funds that we've used to to promote farmland protection. And just as a little bit of history, we initially started our farmland protection work in just two communities. We focused really um, solidly then and still like to take kind of a critical mass approach to building 
farmland protection areas. We find that these build economic resilience in farm communities. That's expanded over time to our work really taking on a larger food shed approach, which for us is the um, actually 11 county region that uh, coincides largely with our service area. And this is important because there are pieces to this that are relevant to the preemptive purchase right and the reasons that we use it. And so, David, if you'll go to the next slide. We've been utilizing preemptive purchase rights, um, like I said, for the last few years and kind of gaining up on, on uh, close to two handfuls of transactions. And folks are probably aware that these are additional legal agreements that work to permanently limit all future sales with the intention of preserving the agricultural land value. Um, and I know that there's been a lot of, there's been in other presentations that's been talk about the difference between agricultural land value and an affordable land value, but the tool that we use really focuses on agricultural land value. We found that they're largely best utilized in areas where the demand for land um, may make a conservation easement alone of an ineffective tool at keeping agricultural land values and prices in check, particularly in our service area. That currently means that, and Holly showed, Holly showed a slide, um, in Holly's slide you saw the difference between full fair market value the value um, with an easement, the value of land protected with a, with, a, with a preemptive purchase right, or the value at ag value, and how different those can be. And particularly in places where there's a lot of competition from non-agricultural land buyers, we found that the uh, conservation easement alone, and for us even conservation easements with the right of first refusal, and I'll pin that for a little bit further discussion uh, going up a little bit later on, these just weren't effective, you know, we weren't getting quite the conservation um, outcome that we had intended um, as many as 20 years ago, but even more recently than that. Um, and so we find that the tool is most effective there, but I think what's important as we talk about it today is that there are a lot of considerations for use in this area before it's an issue. Um, in a lot of ways, we in the Hudson Valley have looked at um, Long Island to see kind of what's coming up for us, and they've been using tools like this one for longer than, than we have. Um, but I'd also encourage folks who are in places where they're not seeing this as an issue yet to recognize that that's where we were about 10 years ago, um, and, and certainly where we were 20 years ago. And if we had had a tool like a preemptive purchase right built into the 122 easements that came before we started using them, what would, our, what would our landscape look like today in terms of who's owning farmland and who's utilizing it? So that's a really big question I pose to all of us to think about as we think about the use of this tool, whether we are using it now, considering it for specific transactions, or really in the phase of just kind of trying to understand what it means for you, your organization, your service area, and the, and the um, agricultural landowning community um, where you are now. As we all know, um, I, these, this tool, along with conservation easements, it allows for the continued private ownership and use of the land and farm growth and planning. And it probably goes further than other easements do to aid in the transfer between farmers. Um, and you'll see through the, I think through some of the case examples that Marissa and some of the detail that Jim will get just how that works. I last want to touch on the fact that some of our transactions have included preemptive purchase rights that also included as part and parcel a commercial agricultural use requirement. And the, you may want to think about that um, as you're thinking about your programming and your overall conservation objectives. Again, we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail coming up. One of the things that I'll would notice is, yeah, we're in good spot. One of the things that I'll also note when I think Holly noted that you know Vermont and Massachusetts uh, began using this tool long before we do. Folks, I think there are folks will know that their um, use of an OPAP or an option to purchase an agricultural value is quite similar in function to our preemptive purchase right here in New York State. I'll touch a little bit on why they're why they're similar and why they're why they're different. But I want to touch on the example of Vermont and how it's being 
how it's largely utilized there. And again, um, I think Marissa will will touch on this more in her piece. But you know, the preemptive purchase right does not require us to act to purchase a, a farm, but gives us the option to do that. And more importantly, I think folks are aware that in Vermont, it's largely acted as a backstop. And 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 because it exists more and more so lands are transacting farmer to farmer at an agricultural at an agricultural value and that really is part of its most um, uh, hefty important role that it, that it that it carries so to that end there's considerations that we need to have when we think about the preemptive purchase right and I'll go through some of the legal financial and stewardship ones at a pretty high level um, I think Folks are familiar with the fact that in New York State, environmental or excuse me, uh, conservation easements are are statutorily um, enabled through the Environmental Conservation Law, um, and that's important because uh, the conservation or excuse me, that preemptive purchase rights. And again, one of the reasons we use a preemptive purchase right as opposed to um, a, a name and a tool that's uh, called an option to purchase an agricultural value comes from the fact that there are statutory restrictions against um, alienation in, in New York State real property law um, that uh, go specifically to the rule against perpetuities and the rule against remote vesting that make the role of the environmental conservation law so important in allowing us to have this tool um, under New York State law and use it as part of a conservation easement. And so I won't get any, into much more of the detail there, but, but if folks have questions, we can, we can cover it later. Um, to that end, it's incredibly important that as part of a conservation easement, your preemptive purchase right is heavily substantiated within the recital section of your conservation easement. And we encourage everybody to look deeply at the role of um, federal, state, county, and local um, or municipal um, substantiation that they can give to why the preemptive purchase right is so important. Um, that is important because although um, it's our, our understanding from, from legal analysis that, that I think many of us have done or been part of as we've considered uh, preemptive purchase rights, there is no case law on it. And so it's important that we all take the most robust kind of stance we can when we're including preemptive purchase rights in our conservation easements to be certain that they can withstand kind of the test of time as conservation easements themselves had. Currently at Cena Ketson, we are integrating these kinds of, uh, these kinds of restrictions, preemptive purchase rights, and when they include a, uh, an affirmative covenant to farm, right into the body of the conservation easement. Uh, but there has been, um, there has been uh, um, uh, there has been instances where they've been recorded as standalone documents, and I'll talk just a little bit about the pros and cons of that. Um, and we'll look again to our neighbors just to the northeast. Vermont originally, I think, had theirs as standalones. They now incorporate them. But again, at in New York, I think one of the um, main reasons to consider integrating preemptive purchase rights right into the body of your easement goes back to the um, rule against perpetuities and the rule against remote vesting and those things that limit the length or duration or the ability to have perpetually this type of, of right. And we know that by couching it within a conservation easement that is um, enabled statutorily by the conservation easement law, we give ourselves the best bet of being certain that these, um, uh, these additional rights, the preemptive purchase rights, kind of are afforded the protection that, that 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 brings them when we think about perpetuity and our role in um, making sure that our easements and and preemptive purchase rights as parts of them stand the test of time. But that said, we have seen them recorded as standalone documents outside of the original conservation easements. Um, did we? Um, I want to touch on the fact that by and large, we find that they're being done contemporaneous with original or as part of a, a, an original conservation easement, but there is reason to discuss or be familiar with um, them being done either as overlays or easement amendments, meaning that they would come later in time as a second standalone um, 
restriction or right that you may be acquiring, um, and whether that's done as a second conservation easement that overlays the first or as an amendment to the original. Um, I'll note here at Scenic Hudson, um, we have taken the position that um, because we hold rights of first refusals on many of those, um, almost all, almost every one of those conservation, agricultural conservation easements that doesn't include a preemptive right, we hold a right of first refusal um, that we had taken the stance of amending to replace a right of first refusal with a preemptive purchase right. So that's a consideration you might want to give if this was a tool you were thinking about for a, for a um, existing conservation I want to move into some of the financial considerations that um, we've given and um, along with our partners um, for preemptive purchase rights. I think the obvious first one is that preemptive purchase rights increase the cost to purchase a conservation easement, sometimes quite substantially. And what we've found is that this is um, related to the restrictiveness of the of the um, of the right, but also equally related to other factors specific to a project. So it may be the um, level of um, available farmland in an area, or the the restrictiveness of the of if they include the covenant to farm. Um, those types of factors go into. Uh, the valuation of a preemptive purchase right. Um, they are appraised. Um, the, the, the experience we have had with appraisers is that they are appraised sometimes um, as an additional increment to a traditional conservation easement, um, uh, one that would affect the, the after value. So as we think about kind of the traditional before and after scenario two-part analyses that appraisers might often do for a conservation easement. It's been our experience that the appraisal of a preemptive purchase right, um, as again shown by Holly's slide, is further driving down that after value. Sometimes or typically within the, the, the range of about, in our service area, of about 15 to 30 percent, again, depending on a variety of, of, of factors. Um, one of the things that we've, quite frankly, been um, a little bit challenged with with the appraisal of preemptive purchase rights is just the fact that it's a fairly new tool to our toolbox. And um, building the, um, the expertise and the um, appraisal community's awareness and um, availability to do this type of appraisal work is one thing that should be considered when you're thinking about these. You want to kind of talk early um, and often with appraisers to kind of bring them up to speed on this type of tool and if you think that it's something you may want to be using. Jim will talk more specifically ab about funding preemptive purchase rights, but I think it's an important piece to just uh, set a primer for here, which is we've done it a variety of different ways and we've been um, um, uh, fortunate to see it kind of everywhere from a, a donation of these the, the, the value associated with this additional increment all the way up to the full purchase. Um, there's roles for public funding in there, but um, uh, Jim Oldham from Equity Trust, as, as he presents, will, will make you aware of the program that they have. And all of that has been incredibly important for this getting off the ground um, in, for in our service area, um, having the tools and the, and the availability of um, largely public, but um, excuse me, to date largely um, private, but also public funding for these. They are, it's not an insignificant amount of upfront cost. Did I say that right? Or too many double negatives, sorry. It's not an insignificant amount of additional incremental cost on the front end, but we found that the potential in the long run kind of far outweighs that, particularly as we're now looking a little bit in the rearview mirror and seeing a lot of farm land transact um, that's concerned with conservation easements of well above and beyond what we would have ever have, have imagined really at a state value. I want to um, talk about, uh, move on and talk a little bit about stewardship and that is um, that as Marissa will go through, 
um, and some of our case studies, I think, um, and Jim will touch on, but future owners are all bound by the preemptive purchase right and all the requirements of, of it. That, of course, is going to bring, in addition to the land trust responsibility for monitoring and enforcing, um, these are additional rights that you need to hold and therefore consider kind of what are the considerations for you um, in utilizing them or in using this tool, what considerations did you as a land trust or, or the grantee of a conservation easement think about for your easement and um, endowment funds. Um, we, I just note as a consideration, I'll say it's not enough that we've totally cracked on our end. We've been thinking about what the actual additional incremental costs are and trying to build that in. Um, we've looked at examples, everything from kind of taking the standard um, approach or it's kind of taking our standard um, contribution that we might request um, and doubling it. Um, we've left it the same in some instances, but I think this is also an important consideration for us all to think about. And for those of us that are land trust and are enrolled in terra firma, it's also really important to note that this, um, this piece, uh, preemptive purchase rights, covenant to farms, along with a, a few other things that are listed in the policy, are not included in an insurable interest uh, by, by terra firma. I'll end there. And take any questions or pass it on to Jim. Yeah, let's leave a moment here for questions um, if folks want to ask Carrie anything. Hi, I'll Carrie, take that if it's either really clear or clear as mud. Sorry, this is Erin from the DLC. I just had a quick question. Um, regarding the standalone PPRs, are those ever, um, do those ever happen kind of after a conservation easement has been placed and added to an existing one? Is that kind of a, a possible avenue? Yeah, we have seen that happen um, here in New York State that they have been added, just added as additional conservation restrictions after the fact, kind of as their own kind of overlay conservation easement. I think one of the things to consider is kind of how it is, um, you know, how it's how it's um, how it's how it's couched in. In is it is it an additional conservation easement or is it a is it a standalone preemptive purchase right? I think we're leaning towards it's really important that they be part of a conservation easement, whether that's an overlay or an amendment to an original one. Okay, thanks. And again, that has to go to the to the fact of being um, protected by the environmental conservation law for, for issues related to perpetual perpetuityness. It's not a word, but thank you. Well, looks like we have a couple chats here. Um, from Karen, as it says, Carrie mentioned donation of the value of a PPR versus purchase. Any information on whether the, that donation was tax deductible? Yep, and I, to Jim's point, to Jim had uh, jumped in and answered that that it is, um, especially if it's in a if, it, if it's um, a single transaction where that additional amount could just be um, identified as a bargain sale. That's probably your straightest path forward. If it was a separate kind of overlay easement, again, you'd have to think about the things that make a conservation easement a conservation easement um, and want to be sure that your preemptive purchase right is that um, so that you're certain that you substantiate and are, are within the, the meaning of the, of the charitable conservation contribution as required by the IRS. Thanks, everyone. All right. Well, let's hand it off to Jim. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Jim Oldham from Equity Trust. As I said before, uh, mo I know many of you. Uh, Equity Trust is based in Massachusetts, and uh, we work uh, all around the country. Uh, doing 
among other things, doing farmland work. And so what I'm going to be talking about today uh, are two aspects of the preemptive purchase right, uh, both sort of a, a brief overview of the last uh, the changing landscape in New York with using this tool. And then secondly, I'm going to build on Carrie's discussion to a little deeper into, into the technical pieces. And the next slide. So um, equity trust uh, as background, uh, we've been doing uh, work on uh, protecting uh, farmland for, for over 25 years, working on projects scattered around the country with an approach that, that looks at um, what we talk about is, is whole farm protection, protecting the land, but also the infrastructure that's necessary for the land to be in production and, and affordability. And I want to echo Carrie here that, that although we use the term affordability a lot in, at Equity Trust, we really are talking about agricultural value. And the way that I would talk about it is that um, we want the land to be affordable for someone who's working that land, be able to be paid for out of the proceeds from working that land. And, and what we do when we uh, focus on that agricultural value is we're trying to eliminate, uh, just as de removing development rights eliminates competing uses that can drive that um, price up, so too does the, the preemptive purchase right eliminate uh, competing uses such as using the land as private estates. Um, it's, it's in the same way aimed at eliminating those competing uses that drive the price up above that agricultural value. And, and in all of this, the goal is to, to maintain the, the productivity of the land to, to, to get that that social benefit, that public benefit that we get when, when farmland is being used uh, for, for agriculture, producing food and other products for, for the region. Our work at Equity Trust is, is national and we um, carry out our own projects and, and advise uh, on projects working with uh, farmers, with land trusts, with other community uh, organizations uh, on, on various, on, on a wide variety of farmland uh, protection. Next slide. So um, Equity Trust launched uh, our Hudson Valley Farm Affordability Program back in 2013. Uh, the program uh, works in 15 uh, counties, so uh, similar uh, starting from the New York, uh, just north of New York City, up uh, just past uh, Albany, both sides of the, of the river. Uh, we work throughout those counties, or, or we're open to working throughout those counties. We've worked in about uh, half of them so far, carried out projects. Uh, and we have three um, broad uh, types of, we, we bring three tools to the table. We have technical assistance based on the work that we've done elsewhere. Uh, we've, uh, as I'll be talking about in a minute, we've done a lot of work with the other partners um, developing the PPR language that, that we're all using the, the, and working it into conservation easements. We also provide two different types of financing. We've been, uh, as you all know, putting together projects, uh, conservation, uh, farm conservation projects takes time. It takes time to, uh, for the funding to come through. And, and often, um, depending on, on the status of the farm, if there's a transition, in effect, if somebody needs to sell, there, there's often a need for, um, to keep the deal, to keep the farmland protection on track there's a need for someone to be able to step in and secure the property before it's put on the market. And so we've been able to provide low interest bridge loans uh, to farmers in most cases, uh, 
to, to buy the property uh, from an outgoing farmer uh, while waiting to um, sell an easement. Uh, and then we actually have been providing uh, funding toward the purchase of a preemptive purchase right, uh, a contribution toward the uh, total cost of the conservation easement that includes that preemptive purchase right, um, and uh, that and the bulk of the projects that, that I'll be talking about uh, that have happened over the last five or six years, that the preemptive purchase right has been funded in that way. Although it's not the, the key topic for, for today, I do want to mention that uh, we, we actually uh, approach um, farm uh, bringing the we approach uh, putting um, two, we have two different approaches to putting resale restrictions or, or price restrictions on farms, keeping them at agricultural value. In addition to the preemptive purchase right, we also uh, have been funding um, and are open to funding uh, what we call shared equity ownership, uh, which is actually a, a model where a land trust owns the land and leases that land to the farmer under a long-term lease where the farmer can, can purchase, uh, can, can own a share of the farm, essentially the infrastructure on the farm under the terms of that ground lease. And, and I only mention it because it is part of the program. It is something that we are also doing in New York, uh, but um, and if people have questions, so I'd be happy to, to address them uh, offline or, or at the end. Uh, but that, uh, uh, I'll go back to talking now about the preemptive purchase right. And, and one, so the final point that I want to make about this program and, and about the work that we've been doing over the last five or six years, it was designed deliberately to complement the existing farmland protection work that's going on in the region. The other presenters on this call, most of you who are, are listening on the call, are part of that collective um, existing effort. And, and what we've been doing for the past uh, six years has been um, you know, a very collaborative process of uh, working with many partners to, again, develop the tool and make it work in New York and, and continue to improve it. Uh, there's been lots of exchange of information, lots of um, many people in the dialogue throughout this and and I now the next couple of slides I think will show um, you know what what that's produced so when we started the uh, farm affordability landscape in New York uh, was um, a number of the things that you've already heard about uh, we we had neighboring states uh, with their option to purchase at agricultural value um, we, uh, both in Massachusetts and, and in Vermont. Uh, in New York, uh, there, there were also some, some important examples that, that we've all drawn on. Um, Terry already mentioned on Long Island, Peconic Land Trust was using resale restrictions. Uh, I believe they were all in donated easements um, just because there, there, isn't, uh, there hasn't been funding for this. And, and they were dealing with very um, high-priced properties, but uh, they they developed easements that that incorporated resale restrictions, limiting the the price and, and controlling uh, transfers of the farm. Uh, and um, the Agricultural Stewardship Association uh, did the first uh, real preemptive purchase right. Um, in, in a conservation easement in New York back in 2008. Uh, they, they, that was in Washington County, and there was help uh, both from the Castanea Foundation or Castanea Foundation and, and um, American Farmland Trust. And, and that was really where the early uh, legal work uh, addressing some of the questions that Carrie talked about and that we can talk about more at the end if people want about, you know, why this doesn't, um, why this tool doesn't run up against New York's 
um, rules against perpetuities, why it doesn't run up against restraints against alienation, why, why it is, uh, we all, we, we believe and the attorneys that we consult, we believe, um, is a defensible uh, piece of a conservation easement. Uh, so, so again, that that was sort of the basis when we when when the program launched in 2013, uh, when when a number of us began talking about how how to do this, uh, that that was uh, the background um, that we had. Oh, and I did want to mention that that those um, I think Terry said a bit of this, but that uh, option to purchase that they're using in, in Vermont and, and, um, and uh, Massachusetts really is, uh, from a legal point of view, it is uh, the same thing as the preemptive purchase right that we're using. It's, it's, it's not an option that you can exercise at any time. It's just uh, it's, it's a, a first right of refusal effectively. Uh, so now, here we are six years later, um, and the landscapes changed significantly. Um, by my count, there have been 13 farms. Um, I want to double check uh, with David. You guys might have a higher count, but by my count, we've got 13 farms that have been protected using uh, a conservation easement with a preemptive purchase right, uh, located in six different counties here in the Hudson Valley, uh, of which. Um, and, and comprising over 2,000 acres, slightly over 2,000 acres. And I should note that, that I am counting two that haven't quite closed, but one, one of those is going to close on Friday. So I think it's okay that I'm, it's, it's in my numbers there. And, and the, the last one that I've counted, uh, I think will be closing within, by, by the end of the year. Uh, so whereas uh, in 2013, ASA was the only, um, New York Land Trust with uh, an easement with a preemptive purchase right. There are now five, and uh, a number of them are holding uh, several uh, easements that have preemptive purchase rights. Uh, so, so it's it's really um, beginning to catch on, at least in the Hudson Valley. Um, there, there's this uh, growing knowledge, growing interest, and as um, Holly and David talked about uh, the, at a state level, um, the landscape has changed considerably in terms of public funding, both with uh, the Department of Ag and Markets Round 16 um, RFP that, that included uh, funding for the preemptive purchase right. And I believe there are uh, two, um, projects in the works that, that were awarded funding, uh, including the PPR uh, coming out of that round. And then subsequent to that, um, the, that round being launched, uh, the, the legislature and governor uh, passing the Working Farm Protection Act, which again makes it, um, allows this as funding uh, very clearly under statute. So, so that essentially is the the evolution of the of the PPR in New York over these years. Uh, so now I'm going to dive a little bit in. Terry said quite a bit, uh, and I'm not going to go too much more into um, the technical pieces. I know many of you on the phone. Uh, on this um, webinar are actually fairly familiar with the preemptive purchase right. So, so it's possible you'd like to, to go even deeper. Uh, and, I'm, and if you want to, let's do that in questions. Uh, but stepping back in broad strokes, the preemptive purchase right gives the easement holder a right to um, purchase uh, purchase the farm when it comes up for sale uh, for, for an agricultural value. That's an appraisal-based value. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about appraisals in, in, a, in a moment. Um, 
the so again it's the the right is only triggered when there's a proposed sale of the property and transfers certain transfers are exempt if they're to to family members or to or to qualified farmers uh, and qualified farmer has a clear definition that is based on um, someone's income over the last two years that they've uh, earned um, at least 50% of their income from farming. So uh, what this does is it ensures that certain farmers, that, that, the, that an existing owner can sell to an incoming farmer without interference. Uh, other purchasers, uh, it's up to the, the land trust whether they want to approve other purchasers. And as Carrie described in Vermont, uh, our understanding is the, the concept is most of the time what the preemptive purchase right is doing is encouraging sales to another person who will farm the land and setting things up so the, the land trust can, can, can waive its rights. Uh, but if the easement holder wants to exercise its preemptive purchase right when it when the sale has been triggered and when it's not an exempt transfer, the easement holder exercises it by purchasing it itself in theory, but in practice, much more likely is that it will choose to assign. And so essentially, the easement holder can exercise its right and ensure the farm stays in agriculture by uh, identifying a, a, a potential farmer purchaser and assigning its right to that purchaser. Can I have the next slide? Thanks. So um, the, the way it works in detail, one of the important uh, aspects of the PPR is the way it talks about what's required in terms of communication, in terms of notification. Uh, when when a, 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 a farm owner is interested in marketing their property, uh, the easement requires them to inform the easement holder about the marketing. And when they're ready to sell, when they have a proposed Fail again. There's a notification, and when they provide notification, there's information that's expected that allows the land trust to determine is this an exempt transaction. And, and to be an exempt transaction, it has to be to one of, again a family member or a qualified farmer, uh, and it has to be at or below that agricultural value. Now the agricultural value is determined by an appraisal. And, and I did want to add to um, Terry's point about uh, the, the fact that this is new and um, appraisers are still learning about this and, and it's important that they have guidance. One key difference that it's very important to be aware of uh, regarding appraisals and is that Unlike the removal of development rights, the preemptive purchase right actually impacts the value of, of buildings and infrastructure. Removing development rights, you just remove development rights from land. So often appraisers are used to doing their before and after values just looking at the land. But, when, but, but the preemptive purchase right, because it has a different, it, 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 is a different type of restriction in some ways. And what it's doing is, is limiting the pool of potential buyers and, and, and restricting the use of the entire property, including the buildings on the property in, a, in certain ways. And as such, uh, it has an impact on the value of the buildings. So one of the key um, points of instruction for the appraiser when, when they're being asked to appraise for, for um, a conservation easement with a preemptive purchase right is to give before and after values of the entire property, the infrastructure, as well as the land. Um, so again, uh, if the 
transfer is an exempt transfer, the sale may go ahead, the proposed transfer may go ahead. And if it's not exempt, it still may go ahead if the easement holder chooses that. And this is another, this is very important because we deliberately write a fairly narrow restriction on who is an exempt buyer to avoid loopholes, to avoid um, contested situations. But that means there are potential buyers who um, the land trust may well feel are, are highly suited and very appropriate purchasers, but they might not fit the definition of qualified farmer. Uh, the land trust doesn't need to exercise its um, preemptive purchase right in that case. They're, it's able to waive it and allow that transfer. And when it waives it, it only waives it for that one transfer, that the preemptive purchase right remains in effect uh, for all future transfers the next time uh, that property comes up for sale. Go ahead, Dave. So um, because what we're looking at with the preemptive purchase right is trying to um, maintain agricultural value and, and keep the entire property uh, affordable for someone who's going to be working the land, affordable un for an agri under an agricultural income. So sometimes uh, on, with certain properties and, and we, we have um, Collectively, with the farmers involved, with the land trust involved, uh, we've collectively agreed that uh, other restrictions, uh, in addition to the PPR, may be helpful, such as uh, limits on the size and, or number of residential buildings, um, or building in uh, caps on the resale price of those buildings. One of the challenges, again, around appraisals, another challenge, is that determining agricultural value of a residential building is a little bit, uh, is, is, I guess I would say different appraisers have different thoughts about that and we're not quite sure, uh, you know, how that's gonna play out over time. So most of the, most of the easements that, that you'll see that we've been doing, and, and when I say we, I always mean the collective we that, that have been uh, doing these projects for the last six years, uh, there, there is built in a cap of some sort on the, the amount that any residential building can contribute to um, that future resale price. Uh, so, so that's uh, a cap that might be, adjust, be an adjustment to that appraised agricultural value. And uh, I think Carrie already mentioned it, so uh, this is just repeating, um, but in some easements, it's, it's possible to build in, to include also uh, an ongoing requirement that the property be used for, for commercial agricultural use with a, a certain minimum production uh, and an average annual production uh, expectation built into the uh, easement. But, but that's a separate piece that, that isn't essential to, to the preemptive purchase right itself. Next slide. And then finally, I just want to uh, close by mentioning the public funding. Uh, as I said, the, of the 13 um, farm projects that I mentioned, uh, the majority of them, nearly all of them were funded uh, through some mixture of, um, I guess 11 of them were funded solely out of private funding, either money brought by equity trust, money brought by one of the other land trust partners, or and money um, or money donated uh, by the, the owner. Uh, so, uh, and, and then there are two, two of the latest ones um, have federal funding as well. Uh, but uh, but almost all of those easements were almost all of those preemptive purchase rights are e in easements where the purchase of development rights was funded by um, 
was funded by one of those public programs. So, so the language of the PPR has been vetted, uh, you know, has been in easements that are vetted and approved by, by those programs. And in fact, the, the preemptive purchase right is an eligible cost in both programs. Uh, as with the rest of the cost of the easement, neither program funds the, the tool entirely. And, um, and as with all other aspects of the easement, uh, each program has uh, specific expectations and language that, that one needs to be aware of and work with um, in, in writing the preemptive purchase right, just as you do when you're, when you're thinking about uh, permitted and, and restricted activities, just as you, you know, uh, and, and um, other, other aspects of, of a conservation easement. Uh, so I'm gonna stop there, because I think I may have gone over my time, and, uh, but I'll take questions if anyone has any before we pass it on to Marissa. Hi, Jim. This is Terrence with CLC. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great. Um, you might have said this, so I apologize, but has there been any legal challenge to either an OPAV or PPR that you're aware of? The, to the underlying concept of the tool, questioning the validity of the tool, I'm not aware of any. Uh, there have been challenges in, there's been one challenge that I know of in Vermont uh, to the exercise of the OPAV uh, by someone who, who argued, and this was before they improved their definition of qualified farmer, someone who was challenging their, belief, their exercise uh, on the grounds that they were claiming that they were a qualified farmer. Uh, but in the end, that didn't play out in court for, for you know, reasons unrelated to the legal status of the tool. Hey, Jim, is the um, assignability of the preemptive purchase right restricted to a qualified farmer as well, or is that at the discretion of the easement holder? No, it's, it's at the discretion of the easement holder for the reason that I, I said earlier, that the, that definition of qualified farmer is, is deliberately restrictive in order to have a clear line and avoid the type of suit I was just talking about. Nobody can just, you either are or aren't a qualified farmer, but, but we want the discretion for the easement holder to be able to assign to a broader group of people um, because there are many people who are, um, you know, both prepared and, you know, with the, with experience and capability and interest in, in farming the land, who who may not meet that that uh, somewhat tight definition. Great, any other questions for Jim? Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, let's uh, move on to Marissa Cody from Columbia Land Conservancy. Yep, can you all hear me? Can you hear me, David? Yep. Okay, um, so I know most of you on the call, but not everybody. And my section is meant to kind of bring this down to a more organizational level to try to see how a tool like this works for any individual land trust and to kind of walk you through the process of what we went through to get comfortable with the tool and make decisions about using it. Um, so I thought it would be helpful for those of you who are not familiar with us to just take a few minutes to tell you about us um, scale and, and scope of work. Uh, so we work just in Columbia County. Uh, we're a little over 30 years old and on the realm of uh, kind of land protection scale. 
We've protected almost 30,000 acres. About half of that is working farmland. Um, we also own a number of properties. And uh, staff-wise, we have a pretty big staff. I know compared to a lot of New York land trusts, um, we've got 20 people on staff. But really, we've only got three who are dedicated to farm work in particular. We have two conservation easement stewardship staff and some other project staff as well. Um, so if you go to the next slide, David. And then, so one of our programs um, that I oversee, and Terrence and Sam are both on the, the call here, is our farm program. So that stands for Farmland Access Resources and Matching. And a number of years ago, we decided to think about farmland protection in a broader context than just conservation easements. Um, and so we started a program where you're all probably now more familiar than it used to be, the concept of helping farmers find land for lease, helping landowners um, identify farmers, and that program has evolved into a much broader kind of comprehensive package that we offer farmers who come to us for help, whether it's for leases or whether it's for um, technical advice with kind of land options. And all of our farm programs are done in partnership. I listed the organizations that we most work with. I'm sure I forgot some. Um, but all of this work really can't happen without our partnerships, Duchess Land Conservancy, American Farmland Trust, Young Farmers Coalition, Scenic Cuts and Equity Trust, Cooperative Extension, and, and many other kind of local and regional groups. Um, next slide. And so looking just at farmland, conservation, we've protected a little more than 10,000 acres over the years with purchased conservation easements on farms. Um, we, of the, the farms on Jim's slide, um, we have four right now that include the preemptive purchase right and then one that we're working on that I'll uh, walk through with you. Um, and then just for kind of the broader background, we do own a farm, the concept that Jim was talking about, the shared equity ownership arrangement. Um, we work with Equity Trust, Dina Cutson, Duchess Land Conservancy, and many, many other partners um, to purchase a farm earlier this year that we now lease to farmers in the 99-year ground lease and they own the structures. Um, so we're, we're looking at all different kinds of ways to make farmland be affordable and accessible in our region. Um, a little more than uh, $23 million, and again, in partnership, has come to Columbia County Farmers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is just sort of the breakdown of how the money has flowed. We've done some ALE, used to be the Farm and Ranch Land Protection Program um, projects. Those were all in partnership with Cena Cuts and um, around $10 million from the FPIG program, and then almost $10 million in contributions from our partner organizations. Um, and that doesn't count additional donations, so we've had in many projects that have landowner donations um, in that mix as well. Next slide, please. Um, and then just because I think it's helpful in the context of PPRs, the nature of Columbia County, for those of you not as familiar with, with what it's like here, we're about two hours north of New York City. And so we're kind of right on that line between being a rural farm community and being a second homeowner community. So we have a, I don't know what the breakdown is, but we have a strong mix of um, farmland that is used for, for uh, viable farm operations interspersed with a lot of very uh, increasingly so high-end um, second home properties. And so we're constantly walking that line between how do we take farmland that's here, prime farmland where we've got good markets, um, there's a lot of potential, and how do we deal with the fact that the price of land is just escalating. Um, next slide, please. And so um, I thought it would be helpful to walk you through the, the kind of process that, that we went through in thinking about is the preemptive purchase right something that our organization felt comfortable with, wanted to take on, and why. And a lot of our initial 
kind of research came from talking with other groups who had done this. Our first project was a collaboration with Cena Hudson and Equity Trust. Um, and we've attended a number of trainings that Equity Trust and NYFC and others have put on about these concepts. Um, so we, when this first came to us, our first um, project was what encouraged the board to start thinking about the idea. We had a project that we brought to them for which we wanted to include the preemptive purchase right. Um, and we had a number of discussions about what is this, what does it mean, how are we going to be able to steward this. Um, and one of the key pieces that made our board feel comfortable was the concept of the fact that this is um, an, an optional requirement that we would choose to use, but that it, we are not bound to activate in every single situation. Um, we will um, hope to rely heavily on the assignment. We don't have any particular uh, desire to ever own any of these properties. So in the instances when we could, if we needed to activate our right and assign it, um, it's certainly the direction that we would go. And paralleled with the fact that we have a an active and, and large resource of farmers that we work with on a daily basis through our other farmland access programs, our board felt very comfortable that we would not have a problem finding farmers to buy these farms that have protect, been protected with the preemptive purchase right. Um, since we started that, AFT's what used to be the Hudson Valley Farm Link Network has now grown to be the, um, the regional navigator, so it expanded statewide, which I think for those of you who may not have your own in-house programs like we do, it's a really important network that land trust can think about tapping into should the situ situation arise that a farm gets sold when the land trust does feel um, they need to activate their rights. There's a, a quickly growing kind of network of farmers. NYFC also has a, a very strong network of farmers that a land trust could tap into to assign their right, put out a bid, however they chose to, to do that. Um, let's see. Next slide, please. You can go to the next one. Uh, so I'm going to just walk through uh, quickly a, a few of the projects that we've done just uh, to show you what they're like in the, the diversity. We have been surprised, I would say, by the, the range of farms that are interested in this tool. There certainly isn't one particular farm for which this applies to. Um, the, the first two farms that we did were dairies. Walt's Dairy was the second, I think, um, Carrie can correct me later if I'm wrong, um, the second PPR project that we did. So this is a, a large dairy in the town of Copaic uh, that sells to Hudson Valley Fresh. It's adjacent to state-owned land. And this was a federal project. So the ALE program funds 50% of the development rights. In this case, next slide. Um, in this case, Dina Hudson funded the other 50% and equity trust stepped in to fund the preemptive purchase rate. So it was kind of a, a three-part um, funding scheme. And um, really, the, these, this family, their main goal is they want to make sure that their farm is going to stay in farm ownership. It's going to be used for farming. Um, it was a really important consideration for them to know that their farm couldn't be sold off for uh, many estates. Um, and they are still doing well there, as are many dairies right now, trying to figure out how to how to make it work. Um, but they're diversifying a little bit, and it's been a really um, it's been a really good tool for them. Uh, the next project is a slightly different arrangement. We closed on this, I think, the end of 2018. Um, this was also a partnership with Cena Cuts and Equity Trust, and this used FPIG money as well. So the state funded 70, approximately 75%. Um, Cena Cuts and was approximately 25%, and then Equity Trust again funded the preemptive purchase right. Um, and so this is a 
diversified organic um, CSA. It's a well-known operation. Um, the preemptive purchase rate went on a small, smaller piece of a large project. There were two easements involved with this project. The smaller 70-acre piece at closing was sold to the farmer who had been renting it at the agricultural value. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. The next one. And then this last one is the farm that we are working on right now that was funded last year. And so we have not closed yet, but this is one where um, Ag and Markets is contributing directly towards the preemptive purchase rate. And the other ones, the Ag and Markets funded the, um, the PDR and then Equity Trust funded the PTR. Sorry for all the acronyms. So this is, again, a different type of uh, way that this tool can be helpful. This is a 120 acre farm that was historically used for all different types of operations. They were big grape growers, uh, green beans. Um, and so this farm is being transitioned to a um, another local farm family. Uh, if you go to the next slide. And so at closing, what's going to happen? The Kukan Brothers is a, is a well-known um, family farm here. It was a dairy. They sold their cows off a number of years ago, and they have found a more successful farm operation in the, the grain industry. And so they've been renting this farm, and at closing, the preemptive purchase right is going to enable the Kukan Brothers to buy this farm at the agricultural value. And so we are right now in the process of um, finalizing that language. And then just kind of to close out as a summary sort of what's going to happen when so all these these farms that will have protect been protected with the preemptive purchase right so um, when they sell again what's going to happen to reiterate the land trust so CLC will be notified um, and we would then take a take a look at, at what's happening and make a determination if it's being sold to a farmer at agricultural value which is the anticipation that it would happen anyway, um, there's really nothing for us to do. If we take a look and it's getting sold at a, at a price that's not agricultural value, or if it's being sold out of farmer ownership, then we can step in and um, our tool here is really then we could assign it to a farmer and make sure that these farms that were being protected as farms will remain as farms. Um, so that's the end of my part. I'm happy to answer questions um, if you've got them. Hey, Marissa, in your um, PPR projects, what are the timelines around that notification and how much time you have to act and get in touch with your board and get approvals to assign and things of that sort? Mm -hmm. There's different timelines for each step. I'd have to go back and look. They're all something like 60 days or 90 days. There's a series of um, events. Each one has a, a, a number of days to um, play out. We try to strike the right balance between giving us enough time to act, but not being unreasonably um, restrictive in, in holding up sales when farmers want to sell their farms. Um, and I would be happy to share the language that we've got. It would be more useful to wait until we've got it finalized um, with Ag and Markets, but certainly we can share bits and pieces of it. But yeah, it's basically a, a series of 60-day of and 90-day notifications and um, processes. Other questions? All right, thank you, Marissa. Well, if there's no other questions for Marissa right now, um, I'd like to hand it over to um, Dave Bain with Ag and Markets to say a little bit about the state program um, and open things up if there's any specific questions um, that he can address. Dave, are you on? Um, can you hear me? Oh, yep, yep. there you are. Okay, <laughs> thank you.
Dave, do you want to give folks just a, a bit of a parameters around what you can offer to, to answer questions on? But, um, I will attempt to answer you know, whatever questions you might have regarding this tool, use of this tool as it relates to FPIG funding. Um, and my best advice always is to folks looking at uh, pondering if, uh, if something they would like to do is a good fit with FPIG, uh, the Farmland Protection Implementation Grants, that is, is probably look at the last uh, grant opportunity we offered. In this case, I think your best one to compare with is the one we offer every two years. And as has been mentioned a couple of times in this presentation, that would be around 16, the request for proposals. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, we have the caveats that uh, Jim was alluding to, uh, in particular would be looking at the soil quality. Uh, you know, we have an expectation that um, a PPR would not be used for every project. Uh, there probably would have to be some high quality or higher quality soils associated with it. So that would be one thing to probably presume uh, will be in the next one. Um, then there's also looking at the cost share rates that we offer. There's some different opportunities. If you select the highest cost share rate that we offer at 87.5% by statute, that means the landowner must make up the difference. So um, if we're going to contribute, um, you know, potentially uh, towards all of the cost of uh, preemptive purchase rights, if it's a lower cost threshold in, in relation to the value development rights, then um, we still aren't going to give you enough money to pay the landowner 100% of that transaction, uh, that sale, if you will, that purchase, I should say. Uh, so what, what they're looking at is obviously a bigger bargain sale donation because as Carrie indicated, you know, adding in a preemptive purchase right is gonna add to the overall cost of that transaction. So uh, please uh, just take a look at the last opportunity that we offered, uh, like round 16. Take a look at some of the details. Uh, you can take a look at uh, like the table that was in, um, in that grant opportunity don't have it unfortunately right in front of me. I guess it's uh, page 10. If you want to get a point of reference, uh, that kind of summarizes all the details. Um, but I'd be happy to answer any specific questions. Um, but before I do, um, I'd like to just reiterate uh, something that Carrie had touched on um, about you know making a, a case in your whereas clauses, uh, making a kind of the basis for why something uh, like PPR is incorporated into the easement. Um, because I think uh, what I would really echo what a number of the people have said here today is that for those of you pursuing this, uh, you believe, and I think you're on the right track and are hitting the mark, that a farmland affordability is gonna be something that also needs to be protected, if you will, not just the land from development, um, non-farm conversion. But uh, to achieve that, I think you have to really make an effort to make sure that the, um, the body of the document is making the case uh, for that tool. And so I'd really encourage you to incorporate those ideas. Uh, for those of you on the phone, um, I'd be happy to share with you a, a little, uh, several documents I compiled. You can also get it from David if you wanna take that uh, and, and respond to people. Um, otherwise you can contact me directly um, and uh, I'll be happy to share that with you. Uh, are there any questions from anyone? Hey Dave, when uh, the department is looking at whether to fund PPR in these PDR applications or not, um, how much does development pressure come into that play? You just mentioned you'd want to apply this extra funding, uh, sort of the extra cost, if you will, to high quality soils. That makes a lot of sense. I'm wondering also, does the department make a determination of, hey, this is a place where PPR is really important, this place maybe not, or do you treat them all as sort of equal, if you will? Um, Mike, that's a great question. Um, I would say, again, if you take a look at round 16, uh, the RFP, uh, we, we did not address that specifically. And so I think at least looking back in time, uh, that silence on that matter would mean that, you know, it's not gonna be something specifically we're gonna be looking for or scoring, but do keep in mind that, um, with all you know, competitive um, 
applications, which are you know re requests for proposals by design, um, twenty percent of the score that's given to each application or each proposal um, is based on cost effectiveness. And so I'm saying is that when you make an application under an RFP where PPR is allowed, you do need to keep in mind you need to be making a strong case to the reviewers of why they should take that additional cost into account and why that's going to help make the project effective and you know, really achieving what the goal is. I hope that helps. I can also foresee that there could be difficult decisions to make at times. For instance, you know, if a project could go forward as simply putting a conservation easement in place, it might be more likely to get funded. Um, might be nice to have the PPR, but that might put the risk at project of not being competitive then. And that that's a funny thing for for us as an applicant to balance. Any thoughts on that? Um, well, I, you're not the first person to bring those kind of points up to me, and I, I empathize to what that's worth. But I do want to point out is that part of the direction we give our reviewers in the competitive rounds is that uh, you know they they cannot penalize people picking the 87.5% cost share rate, because obviously that's going to cost the state more money than if we give you 75%. The point that I try to make to the reviewers is that what we're looking for is the overall cost effectiveness of the project. And that more often has to do with a cost per acre. And yes, of course, the ones that are most threatened are the ones that are going to be the most costly, but those are also the ones that are most at risk. So again, we try and, you know, um, walk through those kinds of conflicting issues that are out there. Uh, they're very real, but we try and get that across to the reviewers because we're saying we're happy to spend more money, especially if it's achieving policy we like, which is uh, our easement with 87.5%. We're also happy to protect properties that are most threatened because after all, that is the point of the purchase of development rights program. So I don't have a clear answer as usual uh, for you, Mike, but I think those are the things our reviewers wrestle with as much as you do as applicants. I love asking you tough questions, Dave. <laughs> I know you do, and it's great. Keep it up. Great. Um, are there any other questions for Dave or any questions for um, any of the presenters today? We have about 20 minutes left. Um, we don't need to use all of that time. Holly and I have a few minutes of wrap up that we'll do, but um, I'll just let it uh, hang there for, for another minute to see if anyone has any questions percolating. I've got another one that just kind of came to mind, especially for the um, practitioners. I mean, we, I've had my, my own experience quite limited in talking to landowners about this, but um, any thoughts on what it's like? I mean, in a couple instances where I've brought this up, just bringing up the working with the landowner about the concept of the conservation easement is a huge learning curve for them. In my experience, you throw in this preemptive purchase right concept and it's almost, it's just too much for them at that moment. So it's hard to bring them along. Any thoughts on the experience, way, creative ways to explain it to a landowner to get them on board? Um, I'll respond. This is Marissa. I, I mean, I would say we have taken a very light approach to this and, and certainly have not pushed it at anybody. We've been surprised by the positive response that we've gotten. Um, and we have two projects that we know of now where people have heard about as this an option and have um, are wanting to amend their easements to add this provision into their existing easements, as Terry talked about. Um, I think you might be surprised by how many people who are willing to protect their farms um, agree philosophically with what this is doing. Um, it's not just, I think this particular tool perhaps in some ways differently than the conservation easement itself is, is and I'm, I'm guessing here, that it might be even more 
aligned with people's philosophical um, goals of what they want their farm to be used for in the future. Um, certainly, the, the money is an important consideration also. And this is Carrie. Our experience has been very similar to Marissa's um, at Scenic Hudson. We've found that um, it comports with a lot of landowner, particularly farmer landowner um, uh, sentiment in terms of what they're sometimes most interested in in, in protecting their land, um, both the land ethic piece, um, the agricultural piece, and the, of course, as Marissa noted, the financial piece. I, uh, this I would is Dave. say. Oh, I'm go sorry. Go ahead, Gary. Oh, go ahead, David. It's I was just going to add, uh, Mike, as you know, I'm not a practitioner, at least not anymore, but um, I did want to add that, you know, the department recognizes some of the challenges of these, you know, these particular aspects like uh, PPR, but also the importance of having ongoing efforts by all of you folks and kind of, uh, you know, educating potential landowners and, uh, you know, getting the ones that are on the fence, uh, you know, to make a decision, you know, yes or no, are they going to proceed with a, P a PDR in the future? And so I just want to point out is that, you know, we have attempted to uh, offer things in the past, and it's not through the Farmland Protection Implementation Grants Program, but rather through, uh, you know, the Bringing Back Our Land Trust Grants Program. And the very first offering was about land access specifically, and to give grants up to $50,000 to land trusts to educate people about things after going through an exercise to you know, kind of identify uh, properties and also screen landowners. But then the third element of that was to do outreach and, you know, land access was the thrust, which obviously would include things like, well, how are you going to achieve that? And it might be through PPR. Um, and more recently, uh, the offering that was made is that, um, you know, offered the same type of uh, up to $50,000 to encourage land trusts to apply to get the grants to do appraisals on projects. And whether or not they're ever brought before us again as an FPIG doesn't matter. What we wanted is to help you uh, working with landowners who might be again on the fence. They need to know a number. And one of the things that you know Jeff Kehill really made a point of trying to get across to folks is that I encourage you to take a look at working with landowners who might be pondering PPR as part of that appraisal so that you could get a real number on it and you know, we would help pay for that cost. So I, I just want to encourage you all to be thinking about that. And frankly, if you think those things would help in the future, maybe not tomorrow or next month, but you know, keep that in the forefront of when the stakeholders do have opportunity to come before the department, encourage us to maybe continue those kinds of things. Uh, but that's the reason why they were offered. Any other last thoughts, questions? All right, great. Well, um, thank you all so much. Um, Holly and I would just like to provide a little bit of a closing um, on, on sort of our um, vision from the NYFC perspective of um, kind of where we see this, this tool this approach going potentially um, and yeah I just want to recognize that you know preemptive purchase rights are um, have been more immediately needed in Long Island and the Hudson Valley and you know sort of some places in the capital region and um, also I'll note that there were some different counts about um, how many farms have been protected this way we counting at least 15 on Long Island that um, uh, might not be explicitly called preemptive purchase right, but are pretty much the same tool. So that's uh, uh, account for that difference in numbers. Um, we do want to acknowledge that, you know, uh, there's different needs everywhere. Um, but we also really feel like um, this tool can help uh, folks kind of get ahead of the curve when it comes to changing um, real estate pressures. And that we hope that, um, you know, by offering this webinar and hopefully by just continuing the conversation, that as a larger statewide community of land trusts, um, 
you know, uh, folks are, are, have what they need in order to start having those conversations and exploring the, the issues that were discussed today um, to hopefully get to a point um, in the future where, you know, as uh, real estate pressures shift and as realities on the ground shift, um, that you have the tools that you need to respond to um, threats to farmland and respond to farmer needs and farmer interests. Um, Holly, do you want to talk a little bit more about how retroactive funding would play into that potentially? Yeah, sure. Um, I think just to to add that we've heard that there are some, you know, Marissa um, mentioned interest from landowners in putting preemptive purchase rights on projects that have already be, been done. I think that's something that we've been hearing since we've been working on this issue that there's potential interest in and exploring that as well um, as, a, as a potential next step in this, in this work and um, with a lot of potential to increase the um, protection that we've spent a lot of money on as a state and the great work that's already been done. So I think that's one area where we'll be um, happy to work with folks and think through that going forward. And um, just to say in general that Young Farmers Coalition is interested in continuing to be a partner on uh, this program and this tool and other tools that might be out there that can achieve similar goals in terms of increasing farmland access and uh, the affordability for farmers um, into the future. So yeah, I think that's where, where we're at on that. And I just wanna thank all of our presenters a lot too. Um, thank you all for the time to prepare for this and to share your knowledge and kind of the um, real ground, groundbreaking work that you've been doing in the state on this issue and being, being out in front on it um, along with, we know um, others who weren't presenting, but it's been such a team effort and thank you all. Yeah, thank you so much everybody. And thank you to everybody who joined in.